After the conclusion of week one last season, we already knew that it was going to be Penn State, Ohio State, and Michigan competing for the Big Ten Championship. And by the end of October, it was abundantly clear that it would be Michigan versus Ohio State to decide the Big Ten Championship and maybe to decide the National Championship. Well, with Oregon, Washington, USC, and UCLA joining the conference this season, with Jim Harbaugh and most of his staff and 2023 roster departing the program, Ohio State loading up in the transfer portal, and Wisconsin, Nebraska, and even Iowa doing an impressive job at getting new players and or retaining much of their roster, the picture of this conference could look totally different this season. Or it could stay relatively the same. Will Ohio State and Michigan still be the big two? And now it will be the little 16 instead of the little 12? Who are the dark horses and the overrated teams for this season? And how does each Big Ten team perform in the postseason if they make it? Well, not to worry, because we're going to be talking about all these things here on this episode of College Football with Sam, where I debut my updated Big Ten predictions. Before we dive deep, please hit that like button as it helps bring this channel engagement helps us get more followers, even supports us monetarily. And also, hit that big red subscribe button and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release more college football content, whether it's Big Ten prediction videos or other conference prediction videos like this one, specific team deep dive videos, or anything as it relates to college football, you're not going to want to miss it. And please comment your thoughts as we go through this video. Now let's dive in. At 18th in the Big Ten, we have the Indiana Hoosiers, who I have going 3-9, and 0-9 oh in conference play. I think their ceiling is 7-5, and five, and their floor is 3-9. and nine. They return 64% of their production from last year. That also factors in incoming portal players, and they return 10 starters. The strengths of this team are their interior trench play. Surprising given that it's Indiana, but they retained elite offensive tackle Carter Smith, and they brought in C.J. West at defensive tackle and cornerback D'Angelo Pounds, who are some players to watch on the defensive side. Kurt Signetti's specialty at James Madison was defense, and he brought over many of his players from both sides of the ball, from the Dukes to the Hoosiers, and he brought over much of his staff, not just from James Madison, but from many great institutions at the FCS level. That's the question, though, with Kurt Signetti in Indiana. They bring in 31 transfers and have recruited well in the transfer portal department. But so did Tom Allen, and Indiana is a tough place to win. So can they quickly rebuild and succeed? We'll have to see. They can, but I have to see it in order to believe it. At 17th, we have the Northwestern Wildcats. Amazing coaching job last year. Unfortunately for them, I have them at 17th in the Big Ten, going 4-8, 1-8 in Big Ten Conference play. I think they can go 7-5, and five, and that's their ceiling, like the record they achieved last year. Their floor, though, is 2-10. and 10. They returned 59% of their production from last year and 14 starters. The strength of this team is on defense at linebacker and corner, where Xander Mueller is a great linebacker, Theron Johnson's a good corner. They also bring back running back Cam Porter. Those are some players to watch for the Wildcats this upcoming season. Northwestern was raided by the portal. They lost five starters, a lot of them on defense, and also quarterback Brennan Sullivan to other schools, and they won six close games in 2023. Six of their eight wins were by single digits. Correction, actually. Single scores. That, combined with all they lose and a tougher schedule, I think will result in a step back this season. They did hire some new staffers, though, and can their offensive coordinator raise up this unit with some new receivers and a new quarterback. They were atrocious on that side of the ball last year. At 16th, we have the UCLA Bruins, who I have going 3-9, and 1-8 one and eight in Big Ten Conference play. This team's ceiling is just hitting 500 at 6-6. Six and six. I think they could do as badly as 2-10, and 10, maybe even 11-1, and one, at least initially I thought. But they return a surprising amount of their production because they use the portal well. 70% comes back. They return nine starters. The strength of this team is running back and offensive guard, so maybe this team can ground and pound 
Running back T.J. Harden had a productive year last season, an offensive guard Spencer Holstage, and defensive tackle Jay Toya are some other players to watch for the Bruins this coming season. I don't think UCLA will be eligible for the postseason because Chip Kelly left them in terrible shape. There are only 10 incoming high school players, and UCLA has a brutal schedule playing LSU in the non-conference in Oregon, Penn State, USC, road trips to Rutgers, Nebraska, Washington. It, it's just rough. I mean, even Fresno State's one of the better group of five teams. Despite this team having experience, they lack quality depth. And can Deshaun Foster, who has no coordinator or head coaching experience, can he salvage this team and roster? We'll just have to wait and see. I think UCLA is a hard team to read. Maryland, on the other hand, who I have at seven, not 17th, 15th rather, in the Big Ten, It's hard with 18 teams in what is called the Big Ten. Maybe it should be renamed the Big 20. Maryland at 15th. I think they're easier to read. I have them going 5-7, and 2-7 and in the Big Ten. Their ceiling's 8-4. and They do have a wide range of outcomes. I think their floor could be as low as 3-9, and and here's why. They only returned 51% of their production from last year in 10 starters. The strengths of this team are running back, receiver, and linebacker. Roman Hemby at running back, Quashawn Fuller on the D-line, and Kellen Wyatt are some players to watch. And there are others, too, and I think they actually have a really good offensive line staff. And Mike Loxley's done a decent job at building this program and developing it. But his specialty is the offense. And that side of the ball ranks 123rd nationally in returning production, And M.J. Morris and Billy Edwards were not great quarterbacks last year when they played. They lost key pieces also at tight end and all along the offensive line. So who steps up to replace them? Well, with depth concerns and the fact that their schedule, while easier than last year's, is still tough, I think this team's taken a step back. At 14th, we have the Purdue Boilermakers, who I have achieving the same amount of wins as last year, going 4-8. and but going 2-7 and seven in Big Ten Conference play. I think this team's ceiling is 6-6. Six and six. Their floor is 3-9. and nine. They have, I think, one of the toughest schedules in all of the Big Ten, perhaps the toughest, and one of the toughest in the country. I do think they will improve, though. They return 63% of their 2023 production, including 11 starters, and they use the portal well and have been recruiting well out of high school as well. They're strong on the interior of the offensive line with center Gus Hartwig. They're also strong on the interior of the D-line with defensive tackle Cole Brevard. And safety Dylan Thieneman is another player to watch out for in the 2024 season. I do not think Purdue will be eligible for a bowl game. They are recruiting well, though, and they're young. I think 2025 is going to be this team's year. It's going to be a breakout season and a homecoming party for Ryan Walters and company. They have a top 10 strength of schedule and faced a lot of roster attrition, but they did reload in some parts. So can they find some upsets? Upsets will have to be Purdue's path to reach the postseason this year. At 13th, we have the Washington Huskies. Washington, I think, will obviously take a step back from last year's 14-1 national championship runner-up campaign. Their staff and roster has a ton of attrition, but I think they're going seven and six, three and six in Big Ten conference play. Their ceiling is eight and four. Their floor is four and eight. They return only 40% of their production and two starters, but I think they're strong because they've used the portal and the players that stayed received good development. They're strong at running back with Jonah Coleman. They're also strong at linebacker and in the secondary. Alfonso Tuputu, Tuputala, pardon that mispronunciation and cornerback Elijah Jackson are players to look out for this season. I think they're going to get into the guaranteed rate bowl and beat TCU in that bowl game. I think that Washington's staff and players will be motivated as they're mostly new and this team is rather young, and I think that will help them beat a good TCU team in a bowl game against a Big 12 opponent. Can the offensive line sustain this much attrition? I think that's the biggest question for Washington this year, the storyline to follow. 
80% of their 2D players are redshirt sophomores or younger. How will that room look this coming season? Only time will tell, but I'm more optimistic than pessimistic about this offensive line. At 12th, we have the Minnesota Golden Gophers, who I think will go 7-6, and 3-6 and six in Big Ten Conference play this year with a ceiling of 8-4 and four and a floor of 5-7. and seven. Unlike last year where Minnesota was near the bottom of the country in returning production, the Gophers are top 25 in returning production this year, bringing back 71% of their production from 2023, along with 14 starters. They're strong at running back, offensive tackle, and the defensive line. Players such as Darius Taylor at running back, offensive tackle Ariante Ersure, and defensive lineman Jot Joyner are players to pay attention to. I think that they will go to the Dukes Mayo Bowl and play ACC Conference opponent SMU, a good SMU team, and beat them. SMU, I think, will likely be the superior team in the regular season, but I think Minnesota's players will be very motivated And P.J. Fleck, more importantly, has a knack of winning bowl games, regardless if they are big or small. The question for this team is, they have a new defensive coordinator in Corey Heatherman, as Joe Rossi left from Michigan State. And even with talent, their defense last year allowed nearly four touchdowns per game and was awful. So can that side of the ball improve? At 11th, we have the Illinois Fighting Illini, who I have going 5-7, 3-6 in Big Ten Conference play with a ceiling of 8-4, in a floor of 4-8. and eight. They bring back 61% of their 2023 production and 10 starters, and the strengths of this team are running back, the offensive line where they made some impressive moves in the portal, and at running back where they have plenty of experience. Caden Feagan at running back, offensive tackle J.C. Davis, offensive center Josh Kruitz, and linebacker Seth Coleman are some players to watch for this upcoming season. I don't think Illinois is going to reach a bowl game in part because they have Kansas on their non-conference schedule, who's going to be a top 25 opponent, and their schedule with Penn State, Michigan, Oregon, road trips to Nebraska and Rutgers, and even Minnesota, Michigan State, and Purdue are teams with some competency. This is a tough schedule, tougher schedule than Illinois had last year, and this team's very young. Only 7 of 22 starters are seniors, and Luke Altmaier's a big question mark quarterback. This team, due to their youth and the moves they made in the portal, I think they should be much better in 2025. 2025 is going to be Illinois' year. A lot like Brett Bielema's protege and former defensive coordinator, Ryan Walters in Purdue. Illinois' run defense was bad in spite of having Jerzon Newton last year, allowing around 150 rushing yards per game. Can they stop the bleeding with a little bit more experience on defense in 2024? At 10th, we have the USC Trojans, who I have going 6-7, and 4-5 and five in Big Ten Conference play. This team's ceiling is insanely high at 10-2. and two. Their floor, I think, is crazy low at 4-8. and eight. They bring back 60% of their production from 2023 and 7 starters. And they had a good portal class, but good isn't good enough to fill in some of the weaknesses that this team has. The strengths of this team, though, are quarterback, wide receiver, offensive center, and special teams. Quarterback Miller Moss, Zachariah Branch, a receiver and return specialist, offensive center Jonah Monheim, and kicker Dennis Lynch are players to look out for for this upcoming season. I think that USC will play Clemson in the Holiday Bowl losing in what will likely be a very contested game to the Tigers, where we see some opt-outs, but also some inspiration by two staffs that miss the college football playoff and want to end the season off on a high note to build momentum into 2025. USC's defense was awful last year, 90th according to FPI efficiency. DeAnton Lynn, he's an elite defensive coordinator, and Lincoln Riley hired an elite defensive staff. But with a tough schedule a very limited depth chart, and being in year one, what can he do? How quickly can he build up this defense? That will determine whether this team can reach its ceiling or if it will hit its floor, and so will the offensive line. Before we resume this video and get to the second half of the conference, the upper half of the conference, I want to give a shout out to my Patreon members. 
The College Football with Sam Patreon provides shoutouts for supporting at the end of the video, and also at the beginning or middle, your name will be shown. If you're an All-American or Heisman member, you do get bonus perks. All-American members get occasional bonus content. And Heisman members, after six months of membership, get signed College Football with Sam merchandise. And they get to message me directly, whether it's giving content suggestions, or if you just want to talk about college football or anything else, you get to message me directly. And I will respond as soon as I can. You can check out my Patreon page, and I encourage you to join via the link in the description or below in a reply to the pinned comment. And you can also check out my merchandise store if you want to support the channel in another way and get merchandise without having to sign up for six months of a Heisman membership. We have College Football with Sam t-shirts themed in all Big Ten school colors, and we also have hoodies in a black or white color, stickers, even a College Football with Sam coffee mug if that's your thing. I just encourage you to check out those things again via the links in the description and down below in a reply to the pinned comment. So thank you for this listening to this brief message, and also remember to comment your thoughts down below, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click that notification bell, and let's get back right into it. At number nine, we have Michigan State. Not number nine nationally, just number nine in the Big Ten. That's where the Spartans are, ninth. I have them going seven and six, four and five in Big Ten conference play, with a ceiling of nine and three and a floor of four and eight. Like USC, wide range of outcomes. They return 61% of their production from 2023, and they bring back 10 starters. Their strengths of this team are quarterback, running back, interior offensive line, and linebacker. Some players to look out for. For the Spartans this year, a quarterback, Aiden Childs, running back, Nathan Carter, offensive center, Tanner Miller, offensive guard, Luke Newman, and also linebacker, Jordan Hall. And you could add some other players. That linebacker room is pretty deep and some other sections of the team. And I think Jonathan Smith has built one of the best staffs in the country. And in my mind, a bit of a bold opinion here, the best in the Big Ten. I think they will reach the Music City Bowl, but lose to a Tennessee team that is just much deeper, more talented, and will definitely be a top 25 team, maybe even top 20 this year. That'd be a tough matchup for the Spartans to win. The question for Michigan State is, can they produce good defensive play, particularly in the secondary? Uh, the defensive passer rating allowed has been in the bottom 30 since 2021. At eighth, we have the Wisconsin Badgers. Wisconsin, I have going eight and five, five and four in Big Ten Conference play, with a ceiling of 10 and two, a floor of five and seven. Their schedule is very tough, like the previous Trojans and Spartans schedule is. They return 68% of their production from 2023, along with 10 starters. They used the portal phenomenally in my opinion. We'll see how quarterback Tyler Van Dyke pans out. Same with running back Tawi Walker. I know for a fact, though, their wide receiver room is strong. Same with their offensive line, and same with their secondary. Will Pauling at wide receiver, offensive tackle Riley Malman, offensive guard Joe Huber, and cornerback Ricardo Holman, along with linebacker Tackett Curtis, are some players to watch for this season. I think Luke Fickle will improve in year two with a elite staff, and reach the Alamo Bowl, where he, will, where he will beat one of the better Big 12 teams in the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Wisconsin's storyline is their offense, which, despite bringing in Tanner Mordecai, having a good O-line, Braylon Allen, and a good offensive coordinator, they didn't produce much. They were 93rd in scoring offense. So can this unit, with all they bring back and some of the upgrades they've made, will they improve in year two? I think they will. We have the Nebraska Cornhuskers at 7th in the Big Ten. I have them going 10-3, and 6-3 and three in Big Ten Conference play with a ceiling of 10-2 and two and a floor of 6-6. Six and six. They bring back 71% of their roster production from 2023 and 14 starters. This team's strengths is their quarterback position, running back, and pretty much their entire defense, but mostly the defensive line and the defensive back core. 
Dylan Riola, who's a true freshman, but someone I'm very high on. He's a player to watch. Same with running back Emmett Johnson, defensive tackle Nash Huttmacher, defensive back Tommy Hill as well. Those are players to pay close attention to. I think that Nebraska, another bold prediction here, will reach the Citrus Bowl and play against Texas. Even though there are other teams that technically would be slotted ahead of Nebraska to play in the Citrus Bowl, I think due to branding purposes, this is going to be the matchup. Former Big 12 rivalry and Nebraska's fan base will be dying to reach a bowl game. I think Nebraska beats Texas because Texas won't be interested in playing in anything that isn't a playoff game. Nebraska is going to come out in fight on fire and do whatever it takes to get their first bowl win since I don't know when they won their last bowl game. I think it was 2015. The storyline is how will true freshman quarterback Dylan Riola perform? Nebraska was outside of the top 100th in quarterback efficiency last year. I expect a massive improvement at that position. At sixth, we have the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. I think Rutgers goes 10-3, and 7-2 and two in Big Ten Conference play, with a ceiling of 11-1, and one, a floor of 6-6. Six and six. Just because of some of the limitations this roster still has, that's why I have them with a low floor. But their schedule's easy, and this roster and team, I think, is as tough as nails, so I could also see them exploding this year. They bring back 72% of their production with 14 starters. Running back, the trenches, linebacker, and defensive back are the strengths of this team. Running back Kyle Manungai, offensive guard Brian Felter, linebacker Muhammad Ture and Tyreen Powell, and cornerback Robert Longerbeam, and safety Flip Dixon are players to look out for this season. I think that Rutgers will play in the really a quest bowl versus Ole Miss, who will be quite honestly probably snubbed or at least one of the first teams out from the college football playoff. Ole Miss is going to be mad. Rutgers with an easy schedule, maybe a little bit puffed up in the win total. Uh, that'll probably be a bad loss and a dominant win for Ole Miss. The storyline for Rutgers is can the offense balance out and score more touchdowns? They were 96th in scoring offense despite reaching their first bowl game since 2014. At fifth, we have the Penn State Nittany Lions. Penn State, I think, is going to go 12-2, 8-1 in Big Ten Conference play with a ceiling of 12-0, a floor of 10-2. They return 67% of their production from 2023 and 11 starters. Running back, tight end, defensive line, linebacker, and safety are the strengths of this team. Look out for running backs Nicholas Singleton and Katron Allen, for tight end Tyler Warren, for defensive end Abdul Carter, linebacker Kobe King, and safety Kevin Winston Jr. Penn State will reach the college football playoff for the first time under James Franklin, beating Missouri in a home college football playoff matchup in Happy Valley, but losing in dominant fashion to Georgia in the All-State Sugar Bowl. The questions surrounding this team are, can Cody Kodelnicki make the offense explosive? Penn State was 97th in the number of 20-plus yard plays, almost none of them through the air. The offensive line also loses a lot of production, and it's yet to be seen if James Franklin will even let Kodal Nicky do what he wants to do. So there are questions surrounding this team, but I think they'll take a step forward from last year. Uh, not just because their schedule's easier, but as an overall team in a power ranking sense, they'll be better than last season as well. This is similar to Iowa. Iowa, I think, will improve their record and improve their team quality. I have them going 11-2, and 8-1 and one in the Big Ten for a good fourth place. If you're wondering why some of the placements are weird, look up the Big 12, and I think ACC was divisionless last year, and the old Pac-12 rules as well. Uh, the rules for divisionless placements are interesting, but the strength of conference opponents combined, that determines when there isn't a head-to-head -head result or just some other rules. Look it up. I'm going to link one of these actually in the top right corner of my screen, not just right now, but also in the description. Basically, Iowa has a tougher conference schedule in my mind than Penn State does. That's why they're placed ahead of Penn State, despite Penn State obviously being the better team. But I'm getting ahead of myself and burning up some time. I have Iowa going 11 and 
and one regular season. I think that's their ceiling. Their floor is eight and four. Their top ten in returning production, bringing back seventy nine percent from last year, along with a whopping seventeen starters. They're strong at tight end, the interior of the O line, and their entire defense. Look out for tight end Luke Lachey, offensive center Logan Jones, defensive end Deontay Craig, linebackers Jay Higgins and Nick Jackson and defensive backs Sebastian Castro and Xavier Nwampka. I think Iowa will lose in the first round at Michigan in the college football playoff. The storyline for Iowa is ironically the punting position. Uh, Torrey Taylor averaged nearly 50 yards per punt last year. A can true freshman Rice Dakin, who looks to start this year at the position, can he fill in and perform nearly as well? If he's a bust at punter, Uh, that could actually result in this team falling apart. That's how important special teams are for Iowa. At third, we have the Michigan Wolverines. I have Michigan going 14-2, 8-1 in Big Ten Conference play. This team's ceiling is 12-0. Their floor is 9-3. They only return 40% of their production from last year. Very, very low, along with only five starters coming back. That's not that much, and they could be worse than this. But keep in mind that in 2015, Ohio State had an awesome team. That team should have beaten Michigan State and should have competed for another national title, but they didn't. Stuff happens, just like Michigan's loss to TCU in 2022. And they only returned 36% of their production entering 2016. In 2016, Ohio State, while worse than the 15 and 14 Buckeye teams, was still a top eight, top six team to end the year who was one of the best teams in the Big Ten. Um, by by end-of-season rankings, they actually were the best team in the Big Ten. So Michigan can still perform at a high level, and I think at running back, tight end, the trenches, and defensive back, they'll be one of the best in the country in those positions. Look out for running back Donovan Edwards, tight end Colston Loveland, offensive tackle Miles Hinton, offensive guard Josh Preby, defensive tackles Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, defensive end Josiah Stewart, and cornerback Will Johnson. Those are players to pay attention to this season. I think Michigan will beat Iowa in the first round of the college football playoff. They'll move on to beat Miami in the Peach Bowl. They'll beat Ohio State in a rematch in the Cotton Bowl before losing, like Penn State did, in dominant fashion to Georgia in the national championship game. Michigan, just by how the playoff bracket filled out, just got a lucky draw. When I make updates to my predictions, it could end up differently, and maybe Michigan will be a first or second round exit. So it's just how everything shaped out. But yeah, the question of this team is the passing offense. All starting receivers and quarterback J.J. McCarthy are gone. Oh, Alex Orgy's only thrown one career pass. That's a big question mark for the Wolverines right there, is their passing game. At number two, we have the Oregon Ducks. I have Oregon going 11-3, and 8-1 and one in Big Ten Conference play with a ceiling of 12-0 and 0 and a floor of 9-3. and 3. Being number two in Big Ten standings, I have them reaching the Big Ten Championship game. And along with Ohio State, these two teams are favorites to reach the Big Ten Championship game. I have Oregon. They return 69% of their production from 2023 along with 10 starters coming back. Their strengths are quarterback, running back, wide receiver, offensive line, and their secondary is deep. And don't forget about their defensive line either. They have some good players there. Quarterback Dylan Gabriel, running back Jordan James, offensive tackle of Johnny Cornelius and Josh Connerly Jr., wide receiver Tez Johnson, cornerback Jabbar Muhammad, Defensive tackle, Derek Harmon, along with defensive end Jordan Birch. Those are some players to watch for this upcoming season. I have Oregon beating Ohio State in the regular season, but losing to them in a rematch in Indianapolis. And I have Oregon losing in what would honestly be an upset in my mind to Florida State. But I think that Florida State, due to end of season record and and standings, I think they'd be ranked higher then Oregon, which means Florida State gets home field advantage. It's a long flight for Oregon. And Florida State, I think Florida State's every bit as physical as Oregon is. Oregon has the better weapons on offense. Florida State has the better defense. And I just have that being an upset. And an upset in a playoff game, especially with home field advantage, 
won't be that uncommon. I think we'll see that being maybe even a semi-common theme in the 12-team playoff because home field advantage matters a ton. Oregon's biggest question mark is not just their defense, though their defense has a ton coming back and I think made some upgrades. It's the offense. They had the 52nd best strength of schedule last year. Their strength of schedule is tougher this year, and Big Ten defenses are tenacious. They're tough. They're violent. Can Oregon's offense be just as efficient as these defenses as it was against Pac-12 defenses? And finally, at first place, we have the Ohio State Buckeyes, who I think will go 13-2, and 8-1 and in Big Ten Conference play, and I think they will retake their crown that they last had in 2020 for the Big Ten. This team's ceiling is 12-0. and Their floor is 10-2. and They bring back 65% of their 2023 production and 15 starters. Running back, receiver, and the entire defense are loaded. This defense is going to be generationally talented and perform at an all-time level statistically, just like they did last year. Running backs Quinshawn Judkins and Travion Henderson, receivers Jeremiah Smith and Emeka Egbuka, defensive line players Jack Sawyer, Tyleek Williams, JTT, Ty Hamilton, and then defensive backs Denzel Burke, Jordan Hancock, and Caleb Downs are players to watch this year. I think that Ohio State will beat Oregon in the Big Ten Championship game, avenging their regular season loss to the Ducks and Outson. They will beat Florida State in the Rose Bowl, and they will lose in a close matchup to the Wolverines rematch in the Cotton Bowl, despite beating the Wolverines in the regular season. You will see, I think, in the 12-team playoff as well, it is hard to beat a good team twice. And Michigan and Ohio State, same with Oregon and Ohio State, or Penn State and Ohio State, they could theoretically match up three times. A lot of people are opposed to this. I'm actually for this, and I'm going to make a video sometime in the next week or two talking about why I think that is actually good for the game. It's good for the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry. The reason why I have Michigan winning this game in the postseason, even though I think Ohio State's the better team, perhaps the significantly better team, is Michigan has postseason experience. Their players know how to make a run for the championship. Ohio State's players, I don't think, do. There's a chance that after their first college football playoff win, they could have an emotional letdown. And offensive line play and trench play is more important at winning championships than quarterback play. That may be controversial, but look at McCarthy last year, didn't play well in the national title game. Look at Stetson Bennett at Georgia, who is a gamer, was really good, but in part due to his system, all of those teams had elite offensive lines, and they performed at, some would say, legendary levels in the postseason. And Ohio State, they have questions, not just on the O-line, but on offense. Can Chip Kelly reform the offense? Because Chip Kelly's offense at UCLA wasn't good last year. Newsflash, it wasn't. It was it was poverty, actually, with the given talent. But I think with less responsibility, him being an OC, they will improve. The question is, pass protection, run block, and can the Buckeyes score closer to 35 to 42 points per game rather than closer to 28 points per game? They were only 45th in scoring offense last year. And last but certainly not least, I just want to clear up some confusion with the record predictions that I had and consequentially some of the placements, whether it's Michigan State ahead of USC, despite the fact that I think USC will be a better team than Michigan State, or Iowa ahead of Penn State, despite the fact that I think that Penn State and even Rutgers, Nebraska, and Wisconsin will be better teams than Iowa. Iowa has a better record than most of those teams and is ranked ahead of them. Let me explain. These are my power rankings. These are who I think the best teams, just on an average basis from top to bottom, will be in the Big Ten. We have Ohio State as the best team at first place, Michigan at second, Penn State at third, Oregon at fourth, Nebraska at fifth, Rutgers at sixth, Wisconsin at seventh, Iowa at eighth, USC at 9th, Michigan State at 10th, Minnesota 11th, Washington 12th, Illinois 13th, Purdue 14th, Maryland 15th, UCLA 16th, Northwestern 17th, and Indiana 18th. Just a few brief thoughts. Oregon, I think, 
has the second highest or perhaps the highest ceiling in the Big Ten, but they do have some questions on defense, and they're entering a new conference, a conference that's much better than their conference in the Pac-12. I like Dan Lanning. I like Oregon, but he hasn't won a big game yet, and they have faced much weaker schedules than the one they're going to face in the Big Ten. And again, they do have some questions. They have as many questions as Ohio State does, I think as Penn State does. They don't have the same amount of questions as Michigan does, but Michigan's more solid on defense, and they have the same proven track record that Oregon does in the trenches. Iowa, despite the fact that I have them finishing ahead of Nebraska, Rutgers, and Wisconsin in regards to record, I think on an average basis, you'd rather have Wisconsin, Rutgers, or Nebraska's roster rather than Iowa's. But Iowa's coaching staff finds ways to win, and they don't play Rutgers, but they host Nebraska and Wisconsin. After Nebraska and Wisconsin play an exhausting game or two before they match up with Iowa. Iowa's schedule is just ridiculously favorable. They're tough to beat on the road, and they find ways to win. So despite the fact that I don't have them power rated high, I think they're going to overachieve in regards to their average team performance. And that's really all I have to explain. I just wanted to put these out here for you guys to enjoy and to try and clear up some confusion. Because no, I don't think Iowa's a better team than Penn State. I don't even think they're better than Nebraska, Rutgers, or Wisconsin. And I have Oregon reaching the Big Ten championship game in part because of their ceiling. Like, because of the offense they have, the combined trench play they have, and the fact that they host Ohio State, they probably have the best chance at beating Ohio State compared to Michigan or Penn State, despite the fact that I think Michigan and Penn State will be better than Oregon. That's all I have to say in this video. Also, check out my college football playoff predictions video via the link in the top right corner of your screen or in the link in the description if you want to clear up some of my college football playoff predictions because I listed some of them for Big Ten teams, but there are others. So if you want to get my full college football playoff predictions, click the link in the top right corner of your screen or down in the description. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and I want to give a shout out to my Patreon members. Thanks to Crash2488 and Braska Rascal for being Heisman members. Thanks to Chris Lane, Conrudel OH, and Ismar for being All American members. And thanks to John Lynn, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Austin Christmas, and Janisha Cockrell for being All American, not All American, but All Conference members and sponsoring this video and channel. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all very soon. Bye bye.